from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Surgery on a kernel of corn. We look at the future of robotics being tested out on ag. That could save a life. It's become a focus for the dairy industry. It was a pretty easy decision. Less odor, a treatment system, you know, and especially with the world so tuned in on sustainability. How some producers are turning methane into money and giving ag exports a financial boost. The more markets you have to choose from, the better. How a new program is hoping to move more U.S. ag products overseas right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the testing grounds meet the proving grounds. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. USDA is rolling out its first round of funding for a new program it hopes will boost ag exports. The agency announcing $300 million for 55 U.S. organizations under the Regional Agricultural Promotion Program, or RAP. Now here's a look at some of the groups receiving those funds. They include the Cranberry Institute, the Southern Forest Products Association, the Hazelnut Marketing Board, the U.S. Dairy Export Council, the Brewers Association, and the U.S. Meat Export Federation. We know the potential is out there, but it will take time, consistency, and money to grow new and expanded markets. Our presence in these markets, building relationships with trading partners, and dedicated promotional activities are absolutely necessary, and USDA is pleased to be able to provide the startup capital to tap into these opportunities. These are not overnight uh, home run balls that we're trying to hit. We're trying to hit a bunch of singles that develop into long-term business over decades. You look at, you look at the Mexico market, uh, you, know, you look at the Japan market, it's taken decades to develop these markets. So we're going to have to put decades into the investment in places like Colombia, Central America, Chile, uh, and Africa. So this, this is a very good uh, jump start for that. Uh, the, the RAP program is actually a five-year program. RAP was launched in October of last year with $1.2 billion in total using money from the Commodity Credit Corporation. John Deere is announcing another round of layoffs. The ag equipment maker announcing that 190 workers at its Waterloo, Iowa facility will be laid off on June 22nd. It comes after an earlier layoff of 308 workers back in April. Deere informing employees about the decision during meetings, saying they are part of efforts to balance the workforce with production needs of each factory. The Waterloo facility currently employs around 5,200 people with about 3,300 working in production and maintenance. The company is now predicting a 20 to 25 percent drop in large ag equipment sales due to lower commodity prices, which is impacting farm incomes. Happening right now, crews in Arizona are fighting a wildfire that has already burned more than 14,000 acres near Phoenix. The Wildcat Fire is burning inside Tonto National Forest. It's unknown what sparked the fire, but officials have listed the cause as human. The fire was only reported to be 23% contained as of yesterday morning. The threat of severe weather persists in the upper Midwest and northern plains on Wednesday. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht is here with a look. Yeah, once again, severe weather potential on the table in and across portions of the United States. A little bit different, though, uh, than the setup that we had the last couple of days. So through your Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday night, uh, looking more like parts of Oklahoma, Texas, a little bit into Louisiana where we could see not only strong storms, but heavy downpours as well. Now, this is Thursday at 2 a.m. Into the afternoon we go, and we spread that rain out once again in and across portions of the United States, but it's not attached to a major low-pressure system. It does not mean we can't get severe weather, but in terms of widespread and everything coming together like what it did the last couple of days, uh, we're looking at more isolated incidents of severe weather rather than widespread. In fact, uh, you look back up here towards the Dakotas, you know, Maybe a little mix of precipitation. That would be more of a, a threat for uh, hail as well as some cold rain. This is Friday again at 9 a.m. So again, going into the weekend, uh, no major systems, but enough out there for some concern in portions of the United States. And Drake says he planted this corn on April 22nd at Drake Farms in Indiana. It looks like things are off to a good start. I'll have more in your forecast coming up. Brace yourself. It could be an active year in terms of hurricanes with a hot and dry weather in the High Plains region and 
the wet weather across the United States. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says that's likely going to lead to a very active tropical season in the Atlantic Basin. When you have La Nina, that tends to not tear hurricanes apart as they develop, unlike El Nino, which is a weakening factor for developing storms. So look for a lot of storms to be prowling the Atlantic this summer and autumn. And while that will keep the south and the eastern U.S. and possibly the lower Midwest wet, we do have to be concerned about hurricane strikes as well. The Atlantic hurricane season officially starts June 1st. NOAA will issue its outlook for the hurricane season tomorrow. An update to a story we've been following since late March, almost two months after its collision with a Baltimore bridge, the trapped cargo ship Dolly has been refloated and hauled from the wreckage site. It's been moved two and a half miles to Baltimore's Marine Terminal. This is a crucial step toward reopening the key port, which could happen by the end of the month. That port, a hub for agricultural equipment in the country. The State of the Dairy Industry Report on Ag Day is brought to you by Empower Dairy from Merck Animal Health. Only Merck Animal Health combines technology and biopharma products for a true full solution approach to dairy management. See how at m-power-dairy.com. And by Robo Agrifinance. Discover how local relationship managers and global sector expertise can help you address challenges and seize opportunities. Robo Agrifinance. Let's talk. Learn more at roboag.com. The team at Dairy Herd Management and Milk Business Quarterly recently produced a state of the dairy industry report. Of the producers surveyed, they indicate that sustainability will be a focus for them in the next three to five years, with roughly half replacing or improving their facilities for animal comfort and 27% adding technologies to reduce their carbon footprint. Ag Day's Michelle Rook visited a South Dakota dairy operation that is ahead of the curve. Bodewine Farms just north of Sioux Falls was one of the first dairy operations in the region to install a methane digester and it's greatly lowered their carbon footprint. When it comes to sustainability, Bodewine Farms has always been on the cutting edge. They embarked in a partnership with energy company Brightmark more than two years ago to install this methane digester. They really own the assets and we just, uh, we get some revenue um, by letting them use the manure stream um, and make the gas. Manure from the 5,000 cow dairy is converted to renewable natural gas and delivered by a pipeline. Bodewine says even without the revenue stream, the technology was a no-brainer because it fit into his sustainability goals. It was a pretty easy decision. Less odor, a treatment system, you know, and especially with the world so tuned in on sustainability. The conversion process starts with separating the sand used in their cow beds from the manure. And we use dirty water from the dairy to facilitate the removal of the sand. And then we separate the manure solids and we partition that off and send it to the methane digester. When it enters the methane digester, um, it's in there for over 20 some days and heated at temperatures of about 100 degrees. And that uh, provides a perfect environment for microbial activity and uh, creating the methane gas. He says by capturing that methane, it doesn't dissipate into the atmosphere. Methane's 26 times more potent than CO2. So from a sustainability standpoint, we're moving the dial more if we capture methane. But he says manure management is just one part of his plan to become not just carbon neutral, but carbon negative. So one of our focuses is cow comfort, animal health, and getting the most out of each individual animal. And that in itself, you know, lowers our carbon footprint. And Bodewine isn't alone. Dairy producers in our survey embrace sustainable practices and are now looking at how to make it a revenue stream. What the industry really needs is a working economic model. Brands have money and they, they want to buy sustainable outcomes. Um, but the big barrier, I think, for the industry has been lack of credible sustainability data. So the industry is looking at specifications for low carbon ingredients with bulletproof data tracking. So people want to issue a spec to, to get a low carbon ingredient, but to buy it and pay a premium for it, they need to know that all the underlying data to support that claim has to be there. 
and it has to be in a place where it's auditable and it's above question. Since 90% of the greenhouse gas footprint for dairy products comes from the farm, Borman sees producers using technology to score standard operating practices and then get paid a premium. What we're seeing with brands right now is a willingness to pay anywhere between three to five or, or, or more in terms of premiums. He says the practices with the biggest impact on premiums are manure management and animal nutrition. So producers focusing on those areas will see more money in their milk check in the future. I'm Michelle Brook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. USDA says it's making a more than $30 million investment to historically black land grant universities. In all, the money will be given to 19 universities to fund 68 projects that are designated 1890 historically black land grant universities. Now this spring, Deputy Secretary Torres Small visited 14 land grant institutions, including Virginia State, North Carolina A&T State, Fort Valley State, South Carolina State, and Southern University. 1890 universities enroll 117,000 students each year. They produce 75% of black veterinarians in this country out of Tuskegee Institute, and they richly address research for rural communities, distressed communities, and high-risk communities in the state, and provide low-income farmers, black and brown farmers, historically underserved farmers, whatever you want to call us, with science-based information that helps them succeed. This is what our 1890 institutions do. USDA says the investment is made through the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Cattle markets continue to shine while grains pulled back on Tuesday. We'll have market details next. And later, the fascinating realities of robots and surgery, even delicate enough to operate on this kernel of corn, that story in the country. Corn and soybeans reverse course on Tuesday, going into the red. Michelle Rook is back with details and a look ahead in markets now. Grains and livestock both mixed on Tuesday. John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing is back with us. John, let's talk about the wheat market first. Another higher close. We got above some key technical resistance. Can we keep going now here in the winter wheat contracts? You know, we're going to kind of see how things continue to follow through. You know, we tried to reverse that, that market over with Tuesday's trade. Uh, so we'll see if that pattern can continue. But again, late in the day, here comes those buyers back into that wheat market again, just kind of focusing on money flow. You know, what's happening in terms of that Russian crop, concerns regarding the hybrid rune wheat build also at the same time. Just a, a window here where it just feels like the money wants to at least support that wheat market, uh, whether it deserves it or not. But at least technically, with the closes on Tuesday, things are looking fairly strong. You bet above some real key resistance there. Meanwhile, corn and soybeans did not follow wheat. So did we see some corrective selling there or was that this faster than expected planting pace? That planting pace was a big factor. First off, it was just above the market's expectation when the report came out on Monday afternoon. You know, we got 21% of the corn crop in in a week and that was a pretty impressive number. Analysts didn't think we'd get over the 70 number. Now we're really only a percentage point or two off the main five-year pace, you know, which obviously is adjusted around with some of those slower years that were in there. But, uh, you know, we're still watching the weather very closely. Iowa, Illinois are still kind of traveling below that five-year pace window. Heavy rains working through Iowa the, the last couple of days. So probably will keep things very limited there, uh, at least until the weekend, as long as things stay dry. So that'll be the focus going forward in, in terms of corn, for sure, as well as soybeans. Can we get that last chunk of this crop in? in a decent time window. And cattle were to the plus side. We got above some key chart resistance there. Is that market building in some better cash trade again this week or not? I think the prospects are there. Retail value is 314 on choice carcasses, you know, kind of running at the highest level since back to March. It's increased the packer margin so they can bid into that cash market a little bit more. Nice firm cash trade last week. I think that continues this week. Now the big question for me is the funds, do they push into that cattle market only sitting about 30, 40,000 contracts on the long side. Last year, there were over 100,000 in this time. Thanks so much, John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing. We'll have more Ag Day coming up.
Watch Markets Now with Michelle Rook on the Farm Journal YouTube channel, keeping you updated throughout the day on the markets at the open midday and close. Find out what moved the markets today and what to expect the market to do next. Well, looking ahead uh, through the weekend, remember earlier in the week we talked about things that kind of relax and we get back more to a ridge of high pressure dominating a good portion of the United States. That doesn't mean that we'll be completely dry, uh, but in terms of severe weather and widespread systems, uh, that is going to be limited going into the weekend. I'll show you that. This is a jet stream on Wednesday, already seeing a ridge of high pressure develop back down into the Gulf Coast states. So that's going to bottle up a lot of the energy and the cooler air up here to the north. If we don't have that cooler air back down here to the south, well, then we don't get the uh, that uh, that battle between the warm and the cold. Once again, it does not mean that we won't have severe weather. It's not going to be as widespread. Check out how far this ridge expands back here to the east and even up to the north and to the northeast. Now that's again on Thursday. On Friday, we get a little bit more zonal with that jet stream. Cooler air uh, sitting back up here to the north on Friday, but we are going to inject some energy back down here to the south with a broad trough trying to develop Saturday and into Sunday. So that's going to be the, the start of the next system. That puts that at about Monday and Tuesday of next week with the potential of uh, maybe a storm system moving in and across the United States. So something worth mentioning and keeping an eye on. Uh, speaking of which, as you get to the 26th and the 30th, pocket of some cooler air and normal if not below normal temperatures across the United States, bit of a break from the heat, but it's going to be short lived. You got that pocket of some cooler air in May 26th through the 30th with that ridge back down here to the south, but also reinforcing uh, some high pressure off the west coast, which is eventually going to translate to the east coast after that time period. So think in June, a start of June with that uh, ridge of high pressure uh, moving over here towards the east, which would increase those temperatures and also uh, supply some dry weather, good portion of the United States. Again, that's not this time period. That's after May and into June. Start off with Louisiana, partly cloudy, high around 90 degrees, low of 73. Bruno, Kansas, partly cloudy, high at 77, low of 55. Riverton, Wyoming, partly cloudy, high of 66 degrees. Brazil is starting to add up the losses following devastating flooding in the southern part of that country. In the state of Rio Grande do Sul, hog farmers lost an estimated 12,600 head. That's after floods submerged entire towns in the state. One expert in the area reporting some 30 farms were impacted, including those suppliers to BRF and JBS. The losses calculated at more than $35 million. Now the state accounts for almost 25% of overall Brazilian pork exports. It's also reported an estimated 279,000 poultry destined for slaughter died as well as 150,000 laying hens. Target says it will lower prices on at least 5,000 frequently bought items and that includes meat. Target also plans to drop prices on items such as milk, bread, soda, fresh fruit and vegetables, snacks and yogurt. The price drop will happen in markets ranging from Phoenix and Minneapolis to New Orleans and Baltimore. The company says the price cuts will be found across dozens of national brands as well as Target's own private brands. Target will report first quarter results later today. Walmart posted strong quarterly sales last week driven by an influx of customers looking for bargains. All right, cutting prices is one thing, but what about cutting during surgery? We'll see how a new robot can delicately maneuver its cuts with precision, and it's using corn to demonstrate. Details next. You know, it's amazing what robots can do these days, including saving your life. Well, Sony unveiling a new surgical robot tool using an ear of corn to show off exactly what it can do. More precisely, using a kernel of corn. And we mean precision. This is a prototype that was recently unveiled at the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers International Conference in Yokohama, Japan. Just watch this for a moment as the robot is able to first cut that tiny corn kernel and then run stitches through it. It works by replicating the movements of the surgeon's hands and fingers. That lets the instrument itself operate smoothly, which of course is useful in microsurgeries. 
The delicate instrument can work in conjunction with a microscope to repair small tissues, veins, and even nerves. Sony says it will work with university medical departments and institutions to help make them more available and more accessible to doctors, taking smart farming and smart surgery to a whole new level. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad to tune in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day. Home Farm Country.